tonight on Bridge City News. From damaging tennis ball-sized hail to flash flooding, southern Alberta was hit with extreme weather Saturday evening. Demonstrators across the United States are demanding change by damaging and defacing Confederate statues in the wake of George Floyd's death. An open letter to the Prime Minister and Premiers from the Canadian travel and tourism industry. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition. Good evening, I'm Loris Alexander. Thank you for joining us. In mere minutes, parts of Calgary being pummeled by extreme weather. Environment Canada warned of a dangerous thunderstorm moving to the region, possibly producing up to tennis ball-sized hail. The hail damaging homes and smashing out vehicle windows. The northeast corner of Calgary being hit the hardest. This was a scene on Deerfoot Trail, semi-trucks and vehicles stranded in a pool of water. Traffic at a standstill. Drivers knee-deep in water, vehicles unsalvageable. Calgary police say luckily no one was injured. As protests against racism and police violence spread across the nation, demonstrators in at least six U.S. cities focused their anger on symbols of the Confederacy, seizing the opportunity to mar Confederate statues and monuments that have ignited debate for years. Many of the monuments were vandalized with spray paint. Protesters tried to topple others from their bases. In response, at least two cities this week have seen them removed from public places. In this moment, everyone is sort of expressing their anger with the fact that it's been over almost 200 years since the end of slavery. And we're still dealing with racism. We're still dealing with police brutality, we're still dealing with unequal treatment. With these symbols standing there, it says, okay, I'm gonna go deface this because white supremacy isn't a physical, there isn't a physical manifestation of white supremacy that you can attack. But here is this monument that I can deface and I can spray paint and I can superimpose images of George Floyd on. And that's where I can express my rage and my anger. <laughs> Almost every Southern County has a Confederate monument on the courthouse lawn. And that is really significant because that is the place that is really the center of government for the entire county. It's the place where people are held in jail before they are um, put on trial, if they are ever put on trial. Um, when you think about the history of lynching, that's the place where often a victim is kidnapped from um, or where a sham trial takes place before a terrible event occurs to that person. Um, and so these monuments become really indelibly linked with that. Alberta announced 37 new cases of COVID-19 on Saturday, bringing the total number of active cases in the province to 403. One death was also reported. Well, these are pretty desperate times for the travel and tourism industry. It's been hit hard by COVID-19 and the resulting border closures. But now, it says it's time to travel again. More than 120 business leaders are behind an open letter to the PM and premiers. The letter asked for the removal of the limitations on interprovincial travel and for a more targeted approach on international travel. It argues the mandatory 14-day quarantine and complete closure of Canada to international visitors is no longer necessary and they need borders to be reopened this summer. Coffee chain Starbucks says it plans to close as many as 200 stores in Canada in the next two years, even after the economy gets back to normal after COVID-19. The Seattle-based company says it plans to open more stores around the world, but will have a smaller footprint in many markets in the U.S. and Canada. If someone had said to you in December that by April, millions of people all over the world would be infected with a mysterious new virus that has no vaccine, you'd think they were talking about a Hollywood script. It happened so fast, it almost doesn't seem real. And it has everyone asking, when will it end? The doors might be open at Brown's social house, but it's far from business as usual. It's really a lot of increased um, cleaning. We've undertaken a very um, intense disinfection sanitiz sanitization 
uh, regime. We do it every hour. Every high contact surface is disinfected, sanitized. In addition, uh, increased cleaning practices for tables. So where we would normally focus on the tabletop itself, it's now a full 360 degree tables, chairs, chair legs, uh, chair backs, the whole nine yards. Uh, and then, of course, not setting the tables, bringing things out to guests as they need them. Browns is not the only business to incorporate meticulous cleaning practices. Tommy Guns requires you to go through a screening process before you're even approved for an appointment. We're not taking walk-ins right now, which is yeah, a little bit different. Um, we ask people to sign in online at TommyGuns.com or on our app, Tommy Guns. Um, from there, you'll get called for some screening questions. When you walk in the front door, there's hand sanitizer first thing when you come in. Um, we ask that people stand two meters apart from each other. Um, the barbers will then ask you to sanitize again when they seat you in the chair. Um, they clean all their tools in between. Sales manager Archie White at McDonald Nissan says people do a little more work online before they come into the dealership. Our traffic was down anyway. People deal online a little bit more. Uh, one thing we had to do in our service department is because it's a, a smaller area in our service drive through is it's just limit one car every visit. So normally we'd have the door open, two cars in, one car waiting outside and handling every person. You just can't do that anymore, right? Because you have to limit your, the, how close you get to people, right, on a daily basis. So um, it takes some learning. It takes some patience. Um, so if you come in through service and you see someone in our drive through it's because we're helping that one person only. We could all use a little therapy right now as we tackle navigating the remnants of COVID-19. One Southern Alberta ranch is using a unique approach through horses to spread peace versus fear during this time of the unknown. What we do in uh, animal assisted therapy is we integrate the animals, mostly the horses, into the counseling process for uh, conditions like anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADHD, things like that. For many, traditional therapies might not be the answer. For one family, they found solace in Tulsa. It's definitely different than talk therapy. I've been in talk therapy and like you get a lot of pressure put on you in talk therapy, but here like you have an animal to support you and you don't like talk about all your problems. You kind of like talk about like a little bit and then you go on and like you have a horse with you, which is always nice. Pulse has been really great to her and um, I have noticed uh, that she's um, a little more optimistic about the future and also starting to show some signs where, you know, like letting go of the things that she can't control. Vanden Hook is aware that with uncertain times, the anxiety might be heightened more than usual. Well, I think the anxiety that comes with any change in uh, our world um, is a big deal, especially for people who are already challenged with managing their anxiety. Um, changes are often very difficult for them to navigate and I think the horses and the animals uh, help people to regulate their emotions and deal with those stresses. It's definitely like nice to have an animal with you so and there's not really that much pressure put on you because you can release all your like feelings to the horse and the horse can also feel your feelings. Blue Rain Ranch has implemented measures for the safety of their clients. So we've done a number of things. Um, we've spaced our sessions uh, further apart so that there's no contact between clients. Um, we've uh, implemented measures that require clients to uh, hand wash when they come and when they leave. Um, between clients, we wipe down all our equipment try to sanitize everything, we wipe down the office. Uh, Marvin has implemented some very effective measures and uh, we do keep the, the six foot uh, barrier and uh, when we are here, you know, Liam and I, my son and I, uh, we just go play outside, maybe throw the football around or something. Recapping one of our top news stories. From damaging tennis ball sized hail to flash flooding, southern Alberta was hit with extreme weather Saturday evening. In mere minutes, parts of Calgary were pummeled by extreme weather. Environment Canada warned of a dangerous thunderstorm moving to the region. And a look at weekend weather. Tonight, partly cloudy with a low of 9 and tomorrow mainly sunny with a high of 18. Imagine living in a country without religious freedom to the point of it actually costing you your life. Unfortunately, that is the reality in some countries. 
BCN's Jeanette Rocher spoke with Greg Musselman, a representative of Voice of the Martyrs Canada, on the costs of practicing what you preach. That interview is up next. Canada is a country where Canadians, for the most part, are able to live out whichever faith they practice and feel safe doing so. But imagine living in a country where your faith could cost you everything, including your family, or in some cases, even your own life. Our guest today is Greg Musselman with the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. He joins me today from Edmonton. Greg, welcome back to our program. So good to have you. Good to be here and uh, nice to be with you, Jeanette. All right. Now, Greg, you've traveled all around the world with your ministry and you've seen all kinds of things and have spoken with all kinds of people, including those who have been persecuted for living out their faith. Now, if we turn our attention to Nigeria for just a moment, the numbers are staggering, aren't they? More than 600 people have been killed this year alone in Nigeria for practicing Christianity. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragic situation, and you know I've just been uh, interviewing a fellow from Nigeria, uh, one of the leaders there, uh, Yanusa is his name, and uh, he's with a ministry called Christian Solidarity Worldwide Nigeria, and we partner with the Voice of the Martyrs with him, and uh, you know just uh, you know hearing what's going on currently, I mean with the Voice of the Martyrs we have our what's called persecution and prayer alert that comes out every week. And there's always something about Nigeria. We found that it's uh, unbelievable, really. You know, when you hear like large statistics, you know, more than 30,000 killed since 2009, 620 or more that we know of anyway, have been killed already this year. When you start to look at it from uh, the individual families, so a, a man named Jonathan Yakubu, his wife and three young children uh, were all killed. And then they had a massive funeral we, you know, they dig this big hole and you see all these people, uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and it breaks your heart. And, you know, as you mentioned, I've traveled all over the world, uh, but Nigeria is probably the country when I go there, when I document the stories of persecution and I come back, it's the one that usually hits me the hardest because talking to people that have had limbs, uh, you know, taken off, um, there's scars, there's family members have been killed, uh, you know, we're trying to help them, the widows especially, and, and with the orphans, but it's a situation that is so brutal and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better. And, you know, so as I was talking to Yanusa, I said, well, if there's no hope that the government's going to, you know, get in here and at least prevent some of this from happening, what's the hope? And his hope is in Jesus that this side of eternity, things are pretty terrible, but there's something to look forward to. That's when we die. And that's really has to be presented before the people of Nigeria to make sure that they have their hope in Christ. Mm, what a tragic situation they are facing over there. So, I mean, that just begs the question then, is Christianity growing or shrinking in numbers there with this persecution? Or is it too early to tell right now with all of that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, in general, Africa uh, has seen quite a, an explosion in Christianity. And we take a country like Nigeria, it's the most populous African nation. And the southern part of the country, for the most part, is predominantly Christian. The northern part of Nigeria is predominantly Muslim. And then you've got in the center part called Plateau State, a city called Jos, and many missionaries uh, that came from Canada, America, and other places, that's where they were. It was kind of the launching point uh, to bring Christ into the northern part of Nigeria. But what has happened is the militant Islamists have determined in their mind they are going to turn Nigeria you know, into an Islamic state and under strict Sharia law. And so as so with that, the Christians that are there, and there's there's significant numbers of Christians that are in uh, northern Nigeria as well. There's churches there and there's communities like this particular one that I was talking about uh, earlier, Gonan Rogo. It is a place that is, is a Baptist village and there's a big Baptist church. And all the people that were recently killed uh, were from that church. So there are areas and pockets where there are Christians. But these Islamists like the Boko Haram, who are listed as the second most uh, terrorist group in the world, and then the Fulani herdsmen, they're number four. So you got both these groups working in northern Nigeria. Um, so there's a lot of persecution. Yet, to answer your question, is Christianity growing in Nigeria? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you're saying how dangerous the north was. So there's pockets of the south that are a little bit more safe than in Nigeria? 
Yeah, there is. Um, yeah, we don't hear a lot of uh, persecution, you know, saying Lagos and some of the uh, larger cities. Uh, I mean, there's still things that are going on. And, and uh, it, it, that can be more of a cultural situation. Let's say a family is Muslim, they're living in the South and family members become Christians, uh, you know, they could be killed, but they're more like being ostracized or losing their jobs, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely there are, you know, people that are coming into relationship with Jesus in the South, um, but because, again, there's not the persecution. And unfortunately, in the southern part of Nigeria, there's some pretty interesting uh, theologies, like the prosperity gospel um, that kind of thing that, uh, you know, they're trying to follow the American way. And there's some things about the church that are a little bit odd. I found one of the things that was really interesting in like Plateau State in the center part. That's where we were. And then we were going into the north and doing interviews. And I remember one particular day I had interviewed a number of people. Uh, one guy uh, told me the story of how uh, his father and a number of the men in his church were you know, driven by the Islamists into the building and they killed them all. And he got cut and shot and he had to pretend he was dead. Uh, Bukhar Samson is his name and eventually became the pastor of that church. Um, but, you know, I, I was, you know, he was telling me the story and I videoed it. In fact, I wrote about him in my book and I seen the scars and then talked to others that had been just through this brutality. And we've met, you know, dozens of children and orphans as a result of the persecution, especially in the north, that have come to the south. And then I was in this uh, hotel and I heard the music and it was worship. And I go, I love African worship. And I'm in there. And then they put on the message, which was on video. And it was a prosperity message about uh, getting a better car and a better life. And I'm going, man, and just down the road, people are dying for Jesus. So they have the same issues and the same challenges, Jeanette, as we do. Um, but yet in the middle of all that, God is working and in, some say in spite of persecution, but I think a lot of the time people have to make a decision. Either you're in the kingdom fully, both feet in, or you're not so sure. And of course, God loves us no matter where we're at, uh, but it does cause people to really, you know, consider the cost, which we are all supposed to do when we follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And of course, speaking of dangerous countries to practice your faith, North Korea and Iran are certainly up there as far as most dangerous places to practice Christianity, right? So how is the underground church doing in North Korea? Well, that's always a very interesting question because for many years, our friends at Open Doors and other ministry that works with persecuted Christians have the world watch list. And North Korea, year after year after year, more than a decade, have been on the top of that list. Now, Afghanistan is, is close to that. But in North Korea, because you've got what's called the Juche system, where it's kind of the worship of the Kim family, and it's basically a ripoff of the Bible. And Christianity, of course, exposes the falseness of Juche. So if you're caught with a Bible, you can be put in a concentration camp. You could be killed. And not only you, but your family members, they're, they're so paranoid of, uh, of Christianity. I mean, interestingly enough, you know, 100 years ago, uh, North Korea was actually stronger than South Korea. Then the war came along and then there was the split. South Korea now has four of the five largest churches in the world. And then just across that border, uh, the D, uh, yeah, just the demilitarized zone there in between North and South is you can be killed for having a Bible or for meeting. But the interesting thing is that the church still is growing. It's growing at a faster rate percentage wise than here in North America. Now, they can't meet publicly. They have their show churches there in Pyongyang, but it's, you know, it's control. They can't openly meet. And so they're meeting in their homes and they have to be very careful even to tell their children if they're Christians, because if their children say something at school, you know, the children come home and mom and dad are gone. They are put in a concentration camp never to be seen again, or they could even be executed. I mean, that's how serious it is. And yet they're meeting in their homes. And what's kind of been an interesting thing is I was talking to Eric Foley and uh, we work with him. He's with Voice of the Martyrs Korea in Seoul. And I've had opportunity to, to be there and to meet North Korean Christians who are absolutely amazing people. But I asked him, well, how is the COVID-19 and the shutdown, you know, affecting the North Korean Christians? And he said, well, it's actually for them, it's been a positive because they have to work long, long days, have very little time at home to, you know, to study the Bible. And they have to, again, doing this in secret. 
but because of the shutdown, they've been put into their homes and the government officials don't want to go near them. And so they've been able to take time of studying the Bible in worship. And then with Voice of the Martyrs Korea out of Seoul, uh, we broadcast into their, uh, you know, the Bible and, you know, commentaries and, and encouraging the believers there. And uh, so for them, this time has been actually in some ways positive. Now, when people say, well, how many Christians are in North Korea? And, uh, you know, it's it's really hard to know the numbers on these things, because what happens is uh, so many of them have been executed, have been imprisoned, but um, it's still growing. So maybe 100,000 and of Christians there, and maybe 30,000 of those would be in concentration camps. Um, but people are coming to know the Lord. And again, getting, you know, numbers in such a closed society is very difficult. But I can tell you, the ones that are there are very determined. And, uh, and when I was talking with Eric the other day, I said, well, how can we pray uh, for Christians in North Korea? What should I tell my Canadian believing friends? And he said, you know, it's interesting that he had asked that question of a North Korean leader many years ago. And uh, this North Korean leader said to him, what pray for us, we pray for you. Now, Greg, you'd mentioned the pandemic. So now you also had mentioned to me uh, earlier that you were supposed to travel to Turkey to speak with some Iranian Christians before this whole pandemic arose, right, for COVID-19. So maybe talk really quickly in the amount of time we have left uh, about what, what you were going to do there. Yeah, we were going to go to Turkey, uh, the southern part, and I was actually going to be doing a trip to Israel with 100 Huntley Street. And uh, that trip got shut down because we had to quarantine for 14 days and the trip was 10 days. So I'm not a mathematician, but that those numbers didn't add up. And then uh, because I was in the neighborhood, I was going to travel with one of our partners that we work with. Uh, that is, he's an Iranian, lives in Canada, and to bring aid to Christian refugees from uh, from Iran, and they were getting into Turkey. Now, I have been there uh, in the past in Turkey and have met with Iranian Christians who have left the country uh, because of the unemployment and the problems and the oppression and the rest of it. And uh, so they have, you know, got into Turkey. So we were going to go there and bring them food and aid and, you know, and get their stories and find other ways in which we can help them. Uh, I know in one case, a family there, uh, two of their children both have severe medical issues. And so Voice of the Martyrs Canada has been helping them. And, you know, just to talk to them, to find out what's going on and how we can help them. Of course, everything got shut down. And, you know, of course, we're concerned because um, the people that we're responsible for, that we feel responsibility for, uh, you know, trying to get the funds there. But I, but I found, Jeanette, is that the Canadian people that support Voice of the Martyrs have not uh, held back their, their giving. In fact, they're really wanting uh, us to help uh, persecuted Christians because whether it's, you know, in Turkey uh, or in other places, especially Pakistan, India, uh, Christian refugees from Syria that are in Lebanon, uh, we're hearing so many cases that the Christians are not getting uh, the food and the supplies that other people are because they are not, say, Muslim, they're not Hindu, whatever the majority religion is. And so they're paying a huge price. And we've heard of Christians that in Pakistan, as an example, that are, uh, that are starving to death and are dying uh, because they can't get food. If, if they would renounce Jesus, they can have food. But they would, many of them would say, I'd rather die than deny Jesus. I mean, and of course, others would maybe, they would say, well, uh, I need food, I need to feed my kids all. I'll just say I'm a Muslim, but in my heart, I'm for Jesus. So, I mean, God is a God of mercy, but uh, these are, you know, there's some difficult situations. In fact, we're going to have a conference call this week uh, with a number of other leaders, well, actually ne next week, uh, from around the world that how the uh, COVID-19 is affecting persecuted Christians and in ways that as, a, as international groups that work with persecuted Christians to help them get food makes you realize how much we really take our freedoms for granted over here when you look at what the rest of the world is going through, what many people are going through. Greg, say thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be on the show, and it was nice talking to you today, Jeanette. Throughout generations, people have probed the Holy Scriptures in search of meaning, purpose, solace, and forgiveness. It's also the ultimate source of timeless leadership principles. Joining me now to talk about it is Joe Turnham, the Economic Development Director for East Alabama, also author of the book, Leading from Our Knees. Joe, welcome to Bridge City News. 
It's great to be with you, Hal. Now, do you think our recent challenges in both your country in the U.S. and here in Canada have caused us to really look at leadership a little bit differently? Without question. And I think, you know, most people think success, successful leadership uh, breeds peace and tranquility, but often it doesn't. And I think leading amidst uh, chaos and destruction and pandemic and economic calamity is probably one of the greatest challenges of leadership. And I think it rattles the faith of those who count on their leaders to solve problems. And many times these problems are beyond the scope of simple solutions. And that's when we measure leadership with a little different uh, uh, yardstick, uh, as you would say. We're here in Canada, meter stick, that's right. Now, do we expect a little too much from those who lead us, you know, our mayors, our premiers, governors, like south of the border? What do you think? How I don't think we think we, we expect too much of them. I, I do think that that uh, that perhaps we are are maybe overconfident or over demanding in what we think the results can be from leadership. You know, we talk about in the book a little bit that many times leadership is not making a good or a bad choice, but making the lesser choices that hurt the fewest or perhaps give us a chance for hope. Uh, and, and I think in these days that we have to allow leaders to, to, to make a few mistakes because they will make mistakes and they're that many times they're making, uh, important, uh, measurements of, of, of do we reopen society at a risk of increasing infections or do we uh, let, let people lose jobs or, or, or get people sick? And these are not easy uh, decisions uh, for leaders. And I think that uh, uh, people sometimes can get uh, cruel and partisan when uh, leaders don't make decisions that they totally agree with. When in fact, if we're constituents of faith that we need to be, that's when we need to ramp up prayers and we need to uh, hope that our leaders are, are getting good advice in the, in the scripture, you know, leaders and kings and, and judges, they relied on, on prophets and, and advisors. And, and, and uh, so I think that we have to look for our leaders to, to be getting the best advice that they can get in these days. Joe, as the Economic Development Director for East Alabama, what have you seen in your present or past work with pastors, heads of state or community leaders? Well, that that every le every leadership situation sometimes is situational, and I think a lot of leaders in, are in situations they've never been in before. I mean, in economic development, we have massive job losses. We have uh, uh, things are getting personal. Places with very uh, high economic standards, people are going to food banks. So you have to you have to recalculate. I think you look more internally. You you know, no person is left behind. You have to to kind of recalibrate how you make decisions and, and how you prioritize decisions. I know economic developers uh, are looking to, you know, sometimes instead of recruiting, we have to rescue. And I think that's been a, uh, a big focus. And, and I think as pastors or leaders of faith, we have to look at it, it maybe not giving the solutions, but giving hope and, and getting in the right direction, the right frame of mind so that we can come out the other end of this, this, uh, the situation that we're in. Hey Joe, sometimes there are no right answers to complex challenges. How do effective leaders really navigate times of uncertainty? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, good leaders uh, exemplify uh, a, a, a humility that, that sometimes the, the issues are beyond them. They reach out for help. They admit mistakes. They're able to change direction. There's nothing wrong in leadership with changing directions. If, if a policy or or perhaps the situations change, leaders can change. And I think uh, asking uh, those that follow you, whether you're uh, an elected official or whether you're uh, just a community leader that, hey, we need to recalibrate today. We need to change directions. Uh, maybe we got the data wrong. Uh, I think those are the those are the kinds of changes that, 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 that people appreciate leaders making in these days. Biblical leaders were far from perfect, Joe. We all know that. Why does God often choose people who seem the least likely people to lead? Well, it, it's it's throughout the scriptures. I mean, you, you look at, you know, whether people were grinding grain or whether they were fishermen or uh, whether they were tending sheep. I mean, uh, uh, God plucked out people of, of really modest means that, that never went to leadership school. And uh, the the leaders of today, sometimes their, their job is not to lead for 
for a long time, but to lead through a certain situation. And uh, I think leaders make mistakes. I mean, David was a man after the heart of God, but you know, he, he, he numbered Israel. He committed adultery. Uh, he was an accessory even to murder, but he became a man after God's own heart. And the, the brothers of Joseph sold him into slavery and, and uh, deprived their own flesh and blood of, of, of opportunity. And in the end, Joseph, when he's dying, looks, looks around, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So, uh, you know, I think leaders today, uh, we need to pray for them, but I think also we need to allow good leaders to make some mistakes. So in your opinion, then, what are some of the core attributes that make for a good leader? Humility. Always look for humility. I think in, in, in leaders that, that, that have that have a heart of love and service. And you can discern that in the way that they conduct themselves. And, and you know, I'll, we, we say here in the Deep South, where I'm from, that, that we want uh, leaders that will be uh, cross bearers and not crown wearers, that, that people that seek to do leadership because they know it's a, a duty, a lift, it, it, it oftentimes uh, brings you under scrutiny and burdens. People that, that run for office or people that want the trappings of success or influence or that need the affirmation of power are usually people that I know will not last or be, be uh, effective leaders. Uh, but uh, a good thing is always humility and, and, and people that, that, that even have a sense of humor that are able to, to be self-deprecating because I, I think in leadership that it will overwhelm anyone. It doesn't matter if you're, you're leading at, at the local or the national level. And I think that, that leaders also that seek uh, the right advice and leaders that, uh, um, that, that have that heart for service. And I think it bleeds through everything they do and say. You talk about being from the Deep South. I can hear that strong Southern accent. When I speak with you, can you hear my strong Canadian accent? I can. It's very beautiful. <laughs> okay. Why do you feel a real kinship with many of the characters and situations in the Bible? You know, I, I have been a political candidate. I've, I've won some races, lost some races. I, I have been on the, the edge of disaster. I have met kings, kings, queens, leaders, presidents over many administrations and, and have been almost driven to my knees uh, in, in trying to understand uh, leadership. And, 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 you know, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me to write this particular book because I think leadership is lonely. It, leadership uh, can destroy families. I've seen many people get get destroyed financially, legally, and otherwise uh, being in leadership. And so I, I felt like God wanted me to uh, to 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 take these lessons of Scripture and offer them to people because we're all leaders, and if we're people of faith, God will call us to leadership. Jonah didn't Jonah didn't want to uh, uh, judge the people. Uh, you know, are you going to go to Nineveh or, or Tarshish? He didn't want to go in the right direction, but if you're a person of faith and God calls you to lead, he will pursue you until you answer that call. So, you know, I think all of us at some point in, in faith will be called, whether it's to lead in our own families, which is the greatest leadership calling of anyone, uh, to, to leading at a, you know, in a network in, in Canada or, or leading, you know, a group of scouts. I mean, I think leadership, we're all blips of eternity, and I think you know, every action that we do will be measured in, in, the, in the fire of heaven. And I think that when we do things in the right heart and the right mind and, and we love each other and we seek forgiveness. And I think in the United States today, we're seeking to understand. Uh, Daniel in, in the Old Testament set his heart to understand. And I think that, that leaders today, whether they, and, and you ask me a quality of a great leader, is leaders that want to understand and hear the opposing voices. And, and bring people to the, to the banquet that have never sat there and hear their perspective. And I think for us to heal, especially in America in these days, uh, you know, love, listening, learning, humility, uh, finding places of where we can agree and de-escalate, uh, that's when I think the Holy Spirit begins to work through situations. Now, in each of your 365 entries, you provide a verse from the Bible and a takeaway lesson can you maybe cite an example or two? Sure. I mean, the title of the book, Leading from Our Knees, is, is actually from the book of Luke. And, and it's Christ setting the example of leadership. And uh, it was uh, Christ went into a mountain one night to pray. 
and it says he prayed all night. And when he descended from the amount from the mountain, he chose his 12 apostles. Big decision he had to make. Son of God, creator of heaven and earth. What does he do? He prays over his decisions. And I think mean, that's an that's a, a, a big takeaway. And you know, the the uh, the book is a, a read through scriptures from from Genesis to Revelation, and we can see from the prophets and the and the prophetesses and and the the disciples and apostles, uh, but Christ Himself. He he knew when to cleanse the temple and and when to be quiet in front of uh, a pilot. And he can he can he can show us in our leadership journeys today how how to lead. Uh, a holy life and a holy leadership journey. Jesus provided the best example of leadership, Joe. What do you see as some of the qualities that Jesus had and demonstrated that we rarely see in our leaders today? Well, Jesus knew what his mission was, and he knew that uh, uh, that, that was going to be a lonely leadership journey. He knew he was going to be tempted. Leaders are tempted. He, you know, he went to the temple. Uh, Satan probably didn't didn't offer him. He, Satan probably said, "There'll be no more plagues. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more tears if you follow me." And in Christ, that was a hard decision. But he quoted the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. And I think Christ uh, also uh, he loved people into the fold. But he also knew that leadership. There's nothing wrong with telling people of faith that there will be suffering in your journey. You know, I, I mean, I also believe in prosperity and and that that people faith can be rewarded by following the, the word of God. But if we are called to leadership, we will suffer. And Christ was a suffering servant. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has ever entered into the heart of any man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And I think that, that if we as people of faith in this earthly journey and this leadership journey that many of us are given, if, if we will keep our eyes on the eternal prize and that if we will love others uh, as we love ourselves and we we forgive seven times seven and uh, that God will lift us up and he will use us in the things that we do. And, and Christ is the perfect example of that. Joe, can a person be a good leader and yet be an unbeliever? Absolutely. And, you know, I think that 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 there's certain principles of leadership. I mean, you, you don't have to be a person of faith necessarily to be humble or to, or to be caring or to love. Um, but we also understand that, that the, the kings and queens and princes and presidents are but the footstool of God. And many times, you know, we leaders think that they're affecting the outcome of eternity. But, you know, God orders the steps. I think he orders the steps of the faithful. I think he orders the steps of unbelievers. Uh, he's the God of all circumstances. So, yeah, sure. I think that uh, that anyone is 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 used in, in leadership, and uh, and and people can have the right heart, not necessarily uh, uh, know the heart of God. So, what advice would you offer parents about their own role in leadership within their families? Uh, be available. Uh, listen. Um, Find times to put the electronics down to do the simple things, to take out grandma's recipe. I, I think, you know, in the quarantine here in the United States, I feel that it was God's gift to us to have to spend time with families. We're not on planes, trains, automobiles. We're forced to be together. You know, that teenager that we can't have a discussion with, there are times that God's opened the door to have that that walking down the street or, or perhaps... Uh, uh, pierce the heart of, of a relative that is, is a stray. And so, you know, let's look at the, the tough times that we faced with the pandemic as, is almost opportunities. And I, and I really believe even here in North America, where we're having a uh, great social disturbance, that it, that it could be a setup for, uh, you know, a huge spiritual awakening in, in our country where, where love and forgiveness and understanding and a, and a search for justice and mercy prevail all that we do. Uh, just as, as the genocide in Rwanda forced people, Hutus and Tutsis, to sit down and to understand how can this happen? Uh, how can we heal? How can we confess? How can we make it better? And, you know, sometimes a setback is a setup for God to work great miracles. So how do you hope readers will use your book, Leading from Our Knees, and what kind of takeaways will there be for non-leaders? 
Well, I think they're they're timeless principles. Uh, you know, you you can you can read the the Christian texts and and they you know they're 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 about you know love and 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 being accountable and and there are a lot of great principles there, just as there are in many faiths uh, in in uh, Buddhism and 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 Islam and other religions. But I think if you if you look at it, that you will see that that many of timeless principles that that many generations have seen from great leaders are really uh, in the, the Old and New Testaments of the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, texts. Joe Turnham, author of the book, Leaning from Our Knees, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank, thank you, Al. God bless. The coronavirus pandemic has shaken the world, causing sickness and death and shutting down the global economy, creating widespread fear. How should we be responding to this as Christians? Joining us today is Dr. Michael Brown, host of the nationally syndicated Line of Fire radio program and author of a new book called When the World Stops. That's available online at AskDrBrown.org. And Dr. Brown, good to have you with us. Thanks. Uh, great to be with you during this very unique season. Yeah, sobering times that we are living in, absolutely. Well, why don't you, first of all, uh, just off the top, give us a brief snapshot of your brand new book. Yeah, I, I was stirred to write this in the midst of the crisis. I, I felt that God was saying something to his people during this time. We had so many questions. What about faith? What about wisdom? What about obeying the government? What does this mean to us as a church? So I, I was stirred to write this contacted a publisher and said, do you want to get a book out now? And basically started the book on March 18th. The book was finished eight days later and is now out today on, on Tuesday, April 21st, amazingly enough. And you could say that there are, there are two fundamental messages that come through every page of the book. One is fear not. We, we must not be in a state of panic as God's people Panic is not appropriate. And no matter what's happening, no matter how great the upheaval, fear not. And the other fundamental message coming through every page of the book is wake up. I believe God is seeking to get our attention. I believe this is meant to be a divine reset time. I believe the goal is not to go back to life as normal. Things should be different when we come through the other end of this crisis. Mm, well said. Yeah, there's a lot of fear out there. Lots of speculation, too, as to who or what caused or sent this virus. And there's, of course, a lot of information, tons of it, and misinformation going on around this. Uh, any thoughts on how we can sort all of that out? Yeah, I actually solicited from hundreds of thousands of Facebook and Twitter followers, what are some of the wildest conspiracy theories that you're hearing? And then I, I pulled out a bunch of them and put them in one of the chapters in the new book, When the World Stops. And it, it is mind boggling. Every day, through the day, I'm sent video after video, link after link. You need to look at this. You need to see this. You need to know what's behind this. And, and look, bottom line right now, we don't know if this is a totally natural phenomenon. We don't know if this started in a lab in China. We don't know if the devil is behind this. We don't know if God said it. And just in terms of factual information that we have. But the key thing is not to try to figure out all of those things, but rather to say, what is God saying in the midst of this? And how can I respond practically? Look, if I'm driving down the road and suddenly the rain starts pouring, my thought is not, what caused this thunderstorm? My thought is not, is this due to natural climate change or is this man-made or, or is this an attack from Mars? No, I turned the windshield wipers on. We don't need to get caught up with every conspiracy theory now. The question is, how do we live practically in the midst of this? And what can we learn as God's people in the midst of this? I'm glad you shared that. Uh, people need to hear what you just said. <laughs> yeah, turn on the windshield wipers, focus on the driving, and leave the other stuff for, you know, hey, government specialists, they can figure that out, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, some of us are asking uh, if this pandemic could possibly be the final plague talked about in the book of Revelation. Now, uh, of course, I mean, I mean, the Bible's not full of conspiracy theories, it's full of truth, but, you know, we need to sort that out as well. You know, is that happening now? Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, that was the very first thing I wrote, March 2nd, uh, the very first article I wrote on this, which is now part of the book. No, this is not the end of the world. This is not one of the plagues.
for the book of Revelation. You say, well, well, how can I be so sure? Okay, number one, if it was one of the plagues from the book of Revelation, it would be accompanied with a message of repentance. There would have been warnings, this is coming. The church would be speaking to the world and saying, God is judging the world, wake up. That's not what happened with this virus. The second thing is that it's not on the level of a plague from the book of Revelation. Listen, if it was one of the judgment plagues from the book of Revelation, quarantining wouldn't help, there'd be no vaccine, there'd be no cure, and we wouldn't just be measuring tens of thousands of lives lost, it would be far more severe. So I do believe that there'll be a shaking at the end of the age beyond anything we've seen. I have a whole chapter on that, that one day the whole world will be shaken. But let, let's put this in its right context. This is We're not going to have the number of casualties, say, that we had from the, the Spanish flu or, or from plagues in the past, you know, the Black Plague in the Middle Ages and things like this. So this is serious. This is deadly. It's definitely something God is speaking through, but let's not exaggerate it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and another question that follows on the heels of that one, uh, people are asking, are we in the final days before the return of Jesus? Well, if you want to look at biblical prophecy, maybe you could say we're in the period called the beginning of sorrows. I, I want to say this. I came to faith in 1971 as a heroin shooting, LSD using long haired Jewish hippie rock drummer. And we were told then it was 1971. This is it. The end is near. All the prophecies had come to pass. Remember Hal Lindsey's famous book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and, and Jerusalem back in Jewish hands in 67, and, and clearly the culture revolution of the 60s. This was the final apostasy, and, and, and all the prophecies were lining up. Well, that was almost 50 years ago. I was 16 then. Our oldest granddaughter is in college at the age of 18, 19 now. So we don't want to exaggerate things, and yet we want to look at what Jesus said. And he says in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 that, that you'll hear wars, rumors of wars, that there'll be famines, earthquakes in different places, even mentions pestilences. He says all these are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs, but then he says, but the end is not yet. So on the one hand, we've been in the period called the last days since Jesus died, on the cross and rose from the dead. And every day we're getting closer to the end, but are we in the final seconds? Is this pandemic a sign that we're in the final seconds? In my view, no, but maybe in the period called the beginning of sorrows. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. And uh, as you put right out in the book, uh, you know, there's a, a need for wisdom and faith, right? So how do we balance uh, the needs of our family along with the faith needed to live for Christ in this time of crisis? Right, so there's a difference between faith and presumption. Presumption willingly puts itself in harm's way and says, God will protect me. That's what Jesus says is putting the Lord to the test and that we shouldn't do. So for example, there's one pastor, a loved, respected man in his community, and he called his church together, defied the government guidelines, said, God is bigger than this virus. We're in a church that believes in healing encouraged folks to hug each other, said, look around, there are more than 10 people here. Well, tragically, he's now passed away. He's with the Lord now, but he died of that very virus. They haven't had the funeral service yet, at least last I read, because four other family members are battling with the virus. As wonderful as this man may have been as a servant of the Lord, that was presumptuous to do that. Proverbs 22.3 says this, that a shrewd man sees danger coming and hides. A, a naive man runs ahead and pays the penalty. So when your kids have chicken pox, you keep them home on a Sunday morning, lest you, can, you, you get the other kids infected. It's not a lack of faith. It's what's called wisdom. So I have faith that God's going to be with me no matter what. The opening chapters of the book, Fear Not, and then how to overcome your fears. The last chapter of the book deals with Psalm 91, opens up the Hebrew text of Psalm 91, a psalm of protection and promise. So I'm taking refuge in the Lord. I'm living without fear, without panic. At the same time, I'm seeking to exercise practical wisdom and also to love my neighbor as myself. I do not want to use my presumption to get infected. I don't even know it. And now I infect my neighbor. I want to step higher. And as long as the safety guidelines don't go too far or not oppressive and unnecessary, then I'm going to honor them for the sake of those around me. 
Yeah, it's like people are taking, you know, scriptures like, um, you know, do not forsake the assembling of the saints. Uh, you know, okay, you know, we are supposed to submit to government authorities, and yet, of course, we have a higher authority, God, but there's a fine line there. We can still gather online, so we're not, you know, disobeying the Lord. We need to get a proper perspective on this, right? Yeah, absolutely. First, do you ever take a vacation? When you take a vacation, it is okay to not go to a church service on a given day. And you're exactly right. Why do we have to gather in a building? I love church buildings. I, I love gathering in buildings. I love big meetings. But I think God wants to say something to us through this. I've got a chapter in the book, What is Church and How Do We Do It? Maybe there are things he wants to speak to us about community in different ways or, or getting every member of the body activated and involved so it's not just kind of a, 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 an audience mentality that we have. And yes, we can assemble together online in so many different ways. What, what, what I'm concerned about is the attitude of the government's not going to tell me what to do. <clears throat> that should not be the attitude of a follower of Jesus. The attitude of a follower of Jesus should be I honor and respect the government and will submit to government guidelines unless the government tells me to disobey God, yep. unless the government is guilty of overreach. So I have a whole chapter in the book. I lay out the arguments about pushing back and when we should. And look, when, when Mayor de Blasio in New York City made the statement that if a church or synagogue defies the meeting ban, that they could be closed for life, permanently shut down, I raise my voice, others raise my voice, and you have no right to do that. That's unconstitutional. There's no justification for it. Well, of course, he walked back from that. He, he had to. So where you have government overreach or churches being singled out, that's one thing. But look, I'm not getting persecuted as a follower of Jesus. When they're shutting down the movie theaters, the restaurants, the bars, the strips clubs, the yep. mosques. You know, How can I think, well, they're persecuting me? where there is discrimination against churches, that's one thing. But basically, what the government's asking us to do is in the best interest of the society. They may not be getting everything right or wrong. The government never mm -hmm. gets everything right yep. all the time. But our attitude should not be defiance. Our attitude should be compliance, unless, as you say, it's telling us to disobey the higher authority, in which case, with all respect to the government, we say, I'm sorry, I have to obey God rather than man. For sure. Now, you also have a bit of advice on caring for our health. I mean, you know, Scripture does talk about that as well. Any thoughts on how we can properly, you know, just practically speaking, steward our bodies during this time? Yeah, look, the number one antidote to this virus is a healthy immune system. And here's what strikes me as, as ironic. We are going through these extreme measures, I mean, potentially crippling the economy, and, and the whole world changed around us. Sports po canceled, Olympics postponed, weddings canceled, funerals held off. I mean, just we've never been through anything like this. And we're doing it for the sake of saving lives. But we could save a lot more lives if we put the French fry down, if we put the burger down, if we put the chocolate ice cream down. <laughs> we could save a whole lot more lives every single year than we're saving through the virus. And look, I was the poster boy for unhealthy eating for 59 years. I wasn't a glutton. I was just a lifetime unhealthy eater. I used to have Oreos for breakfast as a boy. <laughs> I, I was a chocoholic. I could eat pizza and pasta every day for year after year after year after year. And about six years ago, almost six years ago now, God really dealt with me and convicted me and helped me to make a radical lifestyle change to only eat healthy foods all the time. And it has absolutely totally, completely transformed my life. I've literally been getting younger every year. My, my, my blood test health results are absolutely off the charts. Okay. And my immune system is stronger than ever. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a living witness to say, hey, change can come. I'm a living witness to say that, that we can make a difference. So I'm, I'm encouraging folks, and it's in the book, yep. take care of your body. Look, for yourself, for your families, for those you minister to, we need you around, and if you'll take care of yourself now, you'll be able to, to help others be there for your family and have the number one antidote to this virus, a healthy immune system. Yeah, it's wisdom. 
absolutely, and God gives us wisdom and the tools to do that. Uh, running out of time here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Uh, I mean, you, you touched on it earlier. Uh, you know, once this pandemic is over, you know, will our society just go back to normal, or will there be some permanent changes? Will the church, you know, change, stay the same, or will again, you know, be there? Will there be some kind of a shift that takes place? I think something needs to shift, right? Yes, sir. I'm hoping this is a time of divine reset, personally and corporately. On a personal level, let's use this time. If we're for forced home, if we don't have the normal distractions, use it for family, use it for ourselves. Ask questions. What does it really mean to live in the light of eternity? What should our priorities be? Let this be a divine reset and then maybe have a weekly reset, a Sabbath of sorts to step back and evaluate what really matters so we don't just get caught up in the rat race. As for church, we don't just want to go back to normal because we need it to do better than normal. Our, our culture is suffering around us and the church needs to be in a better place. So this is a great time to say, Lord, how can we activate every member of the body? How can we move beyond a spectator Christianity and see an energized, enabled body making a difference? And how can we be more fervent in prayer and, and repentance and really seeking God for a great awakening? My fear is that we're going to go back to normal. My hope is that we're going to come out better than normal. Yeah, God definitely is trying to get our attention here, I think. So uh, uh, let's do our part to cooperate. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Much appreciated. Always great to be with you. You bet. Dr. Michael Brown, he's the author of a brand new book called When the World Stops. You can pick up a copy at askdrbrown.org. And on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thank you so much for watching today.